First of all, I would like to welcome everyone to today's session focusing on research in myotonic dystrophy type 2 or dystrophia myotonia, which we abbreviate as DM2. And um, just to introduce myself, I'm a neurologist and neuromuscular specialist at the University of Rochester in New York. I see patients with DM2 in clinic and I see patients with DM2 in research studies to learn more about how the disease changes over time and investigating the underlying disease mechanism. First of all, I would like to provide an overview of what our session will look like and what to expect. Some of you may be very familiar with the genetic mutation and its consequences that lead to DM and specifically DM2, but some of you may not. And so as an introduction, I would like to briefly summarize how do you get myotonic dystrophy type 2 and why are there so many organ systems that can be involved. The goal is to understand the basic principles, which is important when we later think and learn about the future approaches to treatment. And our overarching goal is to improve the lives of people with DM2 and find treatments that alleviate the symptoms of people with DM2. But how do we get there? So I will briefly summarize or describe the pathway to treatment, which is important when we understand why research takes time, why so many people need to be invested in DM2 research, and at the same time, and why we need to work with one another. It also sets the stage for why the three people who are our guests today in this session are so important. The three researchers that will be in the focus today are Dr. Jenkin from the University of Florida and Albany, Dr. Benhamu from the Scripps Research Institute in Florida, and Dr. Gonzalez Perez from Massachusetts General Hospital. And each of them will provide a brief presentation about their work. But our goal in this session is actually to learn more about who's behind those names and what does it take to carry out this important work. But before we get to the more exciting and interesting part, let's go back um, to a brief reminder about the root cause of myotonic dystrophy type 2. As you know, we're all made out of genes that contain information that determines things like hair color, eye color, or other features. These genes are made of DNA, and this DNA is made out of molecules that carry instructions how to form proteins that our bodies are made of and that we need to live. These genes sit on these structures that look like X's and are called chromosomes in the center of each cell, which we call nucleus. And every one of us has a pair of 22 chromosomes, one that's passed on by the mother and one that's passed on by the father. Not only things that define hair color or eye color are passed on from parents to children, but also genetic information that can cause problems, such as in myotonic dystrophy. In myotonic dystrophy, the is a genetic condition that results from a DNA mutation in a particular gene. And the problem on that gene is that there's actually too much DNA, more than normally located on that gene, on that chromosome. And in DM1, the problem gene is located here on the chromosome 19, while in DM2, the, and that's called DMBK gene, and in DM2, and that's what we're focusing on today, the problem is located on a gene that's sometimes referred to as sync finger 9 gene, but more commonly CNBP gene, and that's located on chromosome 3. So the diseases are located on two different chromosomes and two different genes. Now, as a disclosure up front, everything that I talk about, um, we know some about it, but we don't know enough. So most of the work I, I talk about, and that's been done by many other people, is work in progress. But now let's take a powerful microscope, zooming in on the chromosome here, and zooming in on that section on that chromosome that's made out of DNA, and that's defining the CNBP gene. DNA is made out of nucleotides that, le that we label with letters, um, and that occur in a repetitive order. For example, on an intron on the CNBP gene, there is a section of DNA that contains a repeated sequence of four DNA nucleotides, CCTG, CCTG, CCTG. It is normal to have a certain number of those repeats. However, in patients with DM2, people have more or too many. And in fact, 
it's abnormal to have more than 75 repeats of the CCTG re repetitive code, but most people with DM2 have actually thousands of them. But now you may wonder, why does this cause disease? Well, when the, when the DNA is copied into RNA, the additional DNA, the abnormal additional repeats are also copied into RNA. And so then the expanded repeat on the RNA, the CCUG repeat, they form clumps. And those clumps build a formation in the nucleus, in the middle of the cell, that's called nuclear foci. And so here you see a nucleus of a muscle cell of a patient with DM2 in blue, and the yellow bright dots here in the middle are clumped RNA. In comparison, here you see a healthy, um, a healthy cell with normal length of the gene, and the RNA is diffusely spread, so you don't see any nuclear foci or clumps. So we call these clumps nuclear foci. But why are these RNA clumps toxic, and why do we call them toxic RNA? Well, they don't just clump together, but they also trap important proteins from the MBNL or RBFOX family. Now, why is this a problem? The MBNL or RBFOX proteins usually help to clean and cut RNA, which we call splicing, of various other genes. But now, since they're trapped here in the nucleus and clumped together with the CNBP RNA, they cannot function properly anymore. And as a result, other RNAs from other genes are not properly edited and cut anymore or spliced, and hence they cannot provide the proper template to build proteins. Depending on which RNAs are affected, various symptoms can occur. For example, when the RNA from a chloride channel gene is not properly spliced, myotonia can occur. When RNA from the insulin receptor gene is not properly spliced, diabetes can occur. When the RNA from a calcium channel um, gene is not spliced properly, weakness can occur, and so on. And for example, when the RNA from a sodium channel gene cannot be properly spliced anymore because the proteins are stuck here, or cardiac arrhythmia can occur. Now, this work has been mostly demonstrated in DM1, but our preliminary results in Rochester have shown that in muscle, there's really marked overlap between the misspliced RNA comparing DM1 and DM2 muscle. Quantification of these misplaced RNAs have been used as a biomarker in DM1 previously and may be feasible in DM2. And Paloma um, uh, Gonzalez-Perez will talk more about her approach on this. This slide gives you an idea of what could be targets for treatment. Replacing the gene itself with gene therapy which is something some pharmaceutical companies look at, which has its own risks and, and problems, or targeting the disease at the RNA level by knocking down the toxic levels of RNA or actually releasing those important proteins that are trapped, such as MBNL or RBFOX, or interfere more downstream here on the protein level. Looking at these examples of how toxic RNA from one gene can affect the health of many other genes, explains also why DM can affect so many organ systems, and there are so many various symptoms. As here you see, myotonic dystrophy type 2 can affect many organ systems, and that's because the RNA from the CNBP gene is clumped and trapped in a nuclear foci. It traps important proteins, and that results in abnormal splicing of numerous RNAs originating from numerous different genes coding for important proteins in different tissue types. And so in DM2, there's variability. So you may feel looking at this slide that this is overwhelming, or actually that a lot of the symptoms here I will mention are not applicable to you. Um, that may be because DM2 manifests not the same in every person, and it can be different from person to person, even within a family. Most commonly, people experience muscle weakness, muscle pain, and myotonia, which is the delayed relaxation of the muscle. Now, other symptoms that are common are actually diabetes and other endocrine problems. Um, cataracts, specifically younger than at age, uh, younger than age 55. GI 
issues, constipation, diarrhea, or others, or problems swallowing. What's not on here, in particular in DM2, is also hearing loss, um, difficulty breathing in a subset of people, sleep issues, which most, uh, what I hear from patients is an increased sleep requirement. So people sleep longer than other people without DM2. And then the brain can be affected, what people describe sometimes as brain fog. And then there's the cardiac involvement with, with cardiac conduction abnormalities, which is why people need um, annual EKGs. Now, you may wonder, what can we learn from other diseases? And you hear a lot about DM1 and research in DM1, and even a clinical trial has been done in DM1. And you may wonder, what can we take from that? Um, well, we can learn a lot from other diseases. And here I just go through some examples or some frequently asked questions that we hear from patients. First of all, there are DM1 and DM2, they're not the only diseases that have expanded repeats. There are actually more than 30 diseases due to, that are caused by repeat expansions. And some lessons learned how to find treatments for diseases can be helpful for DM. And um, DM1 and DM2, as you learned, are genetically distinct diseases caused by different mutations but sharing some but not all of the mechanistic features. So how, and me by mechanistic features, what I mean is how the genetic mutation causes disease. Some lessons learned in DM1 can inform research in DM2, but generally you need to keep in mind that DM2 and it's its own body of work, studies, trials, et cetera. And then what also comes up quite a bit is a question about stem cells. And I will just mention that much that um, there has been a lot of, work done in the 80s and 90s on stem cells and myoplast transfer in DM2, but um, there are a lot of troubles with that and the delivery into the muscle has been the barrier. And to my knowledge, this barrier has not been addressed or was never solved. So to my knowledge, um, no one is pursuing this at the moment for DM2. So our overarching goal is to define find treatment for DM2, but how do we get there? In general, in medicine, of 5,000 compounds tested in animals, approximately five will show enough promise in human trials so that a company goes to the FDA and, um, uh, and files an investigational new drug application. So lots of work can be done in the lab of academic centers or pharmaceutical companies, but may not result in a treatment, but some do. And even though the work may not result in treatment of many, um, it can help us learn more about the disease or how to develop other treatments. And so how does it work? Research usually begins here at the bedside. A patient is experiencing a disease or DM2 and you ask us questions. Why do I have muscle weakness? Why did it happen later in life while I had the mutation since birth? Why do I have pain and someone else with the same mutation doesn't have pain? Then scientists and clinicians try to figure out what's causing the disease. And in the lab, scientists discover potential targets for therapy and develop potential drugs. And then they go back to the clinicians and patients and ask, well, we have this compound we would like to treat. It's going to maybe help this symptom. Does this make sense or is this important? And do you have a way to measure if this drug is having effect? And then the clinicians and the patients ask, well, is the drug safe? And so the clinician, uh, the scientist goes back into the lab and does more animal work or other work to test that it's safe. And then when it's defined, it's relatively safe, they come back and a clinical trial will happen, hopefully. And um, once the clinical trial is successful, um, hopefully the drug is uh, good enough to be approved by the FDA and then a whole set of other issues comes up. For example, how do we disseminate the study results? How do we adopt new therapies into the clinic? And um, are we sure we diagnosed everyone who has DM2 and do they have access to treatment? The answer is no, as we know people with DM2 wait on average 12 years after they experience the first symptom until they're correctly diagnosed. And then other issues come up, what are the long-term effects and how do we measure them? You see it's complicated and takes many people and usually involves academia and pharmaceutical industry 
It involves basic scientists and clinical researchers working all together. So what does the infrastructure look like, the research infrastructure look like for DiEM2? This slide gives you an overview of many parties that are currently working on DiEM2. The overarching goal is always to better understand the disease mechanism in DiEM2, which is really a prerequisite for developing targeted treatments for DiEM. So how can we identify what may work to treat DiEM2? Discovering therapeutic candidates. And Jaina Jenkin will be speaking from the Bergen lab and from the Wang lab. And then Dr. Benham will talk from the Disney lab, from the Scripps Research Institute. There are pharmaceutical in companies um, uh, invested in DiEM2, in fact, quite a few, particular focusing just on DM2, and then others that are looking at approaches that could be used in both forms of the disease. And then how can we test therapies safely? Animal models are important for that, and as you can see, there's numerous people involved in that trying to come up with the best model or maybe models that are complementary to one another. How can we test whether a drug is safe and has a meaningful effect in people with DM2? There is clinical research um, preparing for clinical trials because it's not really um, that you can wait until you have a drug and then you start clinical research. In fact, when you design a clinical trial, you have to know what is the natural progression of the disease? How do people do when they're not on a drug? And that helps designing a clinical trial. And also to define outcome measures. How do we measure a potential effect of a drug? And so Dr. Paloma um, Perez will be talking about this, for example, how do we find good biomarkers? And just to give you um, a, a hint here, the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation has developed in 2019 an overview about what the Myotonic Dystrophy Type 2 research landscape looks like. And on the last slide today, there will be a link to that site where you can look for more details. So with that, I would like to introduce the three researchers who are invested in DM2, and we're excited to have them join our session today and the panel. And um, Dr. Jaina Jenkin is a, a, a scientist and PhD at, as a postdoctoral fellow in the Berglund and Wang lab. And she's been in the DM field uh, for a while. Um, her PhD work was focused on discovery of small molecules to treat DM. She is currently an MDF Fellowship grant recipient of this year, and she will give a brief presentation about her work, um, characterizing and optimizing those small molecules um, as potential therapeutics for DM. And then we have Dr. Rafael Benhamu from the Scripps Research Institute, where he is a research associate. And his work is focusing also on discovering molecules that target the root cause of DM2. He's also an MDF Fellowship grant recipient of 2020, and he will give us a brief overview of how his work focuses on engineering small molecules that bind to the RNA repeat expansion that we just talked about. And then we will have Dr. Paloma Gonzalez Press talk. Um, she's the director of the myopathy clinic and researcher in the Wheeler lab as, at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. And she's currently uh, the clinical, she is a clinical research scholar, and she's funded by the Muscle Study Group, um, co-funded by the American Academy of Neurology and the American Brain Foundation. And her work uh, has the goal to investigate molecular biomarkers in myotonic dystrophy type 2. And with that, I would like to pass over to Dr. Jenkin, and I will stop sharing my slides so she can give you a brief overview about her work. All right, so to get this started. All right, um, oh, see if we can, we'll get this in a second. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, thank you, Dr. Hamill. Um, so today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about um, my work in terms of being an MDF research fellow and working to improve the activity of potential small molecules 
um, as therapeutics for patients with both myotonic dystrophy type 1 and type 2. Um, so the Berglund lab actually uh, has quite a history of working with um, a class of small molecules called diamidines and repurposing them for the use uh, as potential therapeutics for myotonic dystrophy type one originally, um, but I'll talk about uh, type two in just a second. So uh, diamidines are, like I said, a class of small molecules and they get their name um, from having these two amidine groups on the outside, um, hence being diamidines. And these have classically been used to treat a trypanosome infection that causes African sleeping sickness. And in 2009, the Berglund group actually did a screen of about 26 small molecules that were known RNA and DNA binders with the hopes of finding uh, compounds that worked to basically dislodge those MBNL proteins that get sequestered by those repeat RNA. And from that screen, they were able to identify um, pentamidine, which was an FDA-approved diamidine uh, used to treat African sleeping sickness. But the interesting thing was that pentamidine also rescued some of the disease phenotypes associated with DM1. Unfortunately, pentamidine had fairly high toxicity in both cell and animal models. Um, but basically, we were able to do chemistry to modify pentamidine in a group of diamidines um, with the goal of increasing the activity, so the ability to rescue these uh, disease phenotypes, and then decrease that toxicity. And we went through several iterations of this until 2015 when we identified furamidine. And this is sort of where I uh, jumped in and really wanted to determine how these diamidines, and specifically furamidine, were working to, to correct the misplacing associated with DM1. And so as Dr. Hamill already talked about, um, we get the production of these repeat RNA that sequester um, MBNL proteins and now they can't do their job, which lead to downstream deleterious effects. And so I was able to show that furamidine actually works to reduce the levels of this repeat RNA and it releases the trapped proteins that are bound to the RNA. And then furthermore, it actually increases the total level of these MBNL proteins. And this sort of collectively works to correct misplacing associated with DM1. And so, I sort of asked, well, why not DM2? And we had heard earlier about how DM1 and DM2, while they are distinct, they actually do share some common disease mechanisms. And so instead of the DMPK gene, we have the CMBP or ZNF9 gene. Instead of a CTG repeat, there's that CCTG repeat. And we also get the production of that structured RNA, that repeat RNA, which sequesters those important proteins. So in theory, furamidine and these diamidines should work to also rescue um, this misplacing associated with DM2. And so I didn't, originally when I started this project, um, I didn't have a lot of cell or animal models available for DM2. Um, however, we did have, uh, at the University of Florida, we had a subset of DM2 patient-derived skin cell lines. Um, and I would just like to take a moment to thank uh, the DM2 community and their willingness to provide these samples for us. We couldn't do what we do without that, so thank you. Um, but I was able to take those uh, skin cells and along with some DM1, and do RNA sequencing. And from that sequencing, I was able to identify splicing targets or splicing biomarkers that were shared by both or um, distinct to either disease. But what this did was it allowed me to identify splicing biomarkers in DM2 cells and look at the difference in the disease state versus uh, non-disease control 
and then treat those cells with increasing concentrations of furamidine or other diamidines. And you can see that we're getting that reversion back to non-disease state splicing. And so this was really exciting because this was sort of the first time that we had been able to show that um, these diamidines are working to rescue both DM1 and DM2 and could potentially work globally across both diseases. And so furthermore, we're using chemistry to again modify furamidine to potentially increase its activity and decrease the toxicity that's uh, associated with it. And so basically from this, the sort of take home is that we can do chemistry to change these you know, X's and Y's here to sort of add or subtract groups and affect the functionality of these compounds. And some of these groups um, can affect things like solubility, um, but one is that these modifications can actually facilitate these compounds to cross the blood-brain barrier, which I think is sort of pivotal in addressing the central nervous system uh, symptoms that affect a lot of patients with DM2. And Furthermore, we can make other modifications that allow these compounds to be um, converted into prodrug forms, which can be used for oral administration. So if we get to the level of the clinic, now these compounds can be taken uh, via a pill instead of something like an injection. And then we're also using computational modeling. So we're using computers to help sort of guide the design of these modifications and these diamidines and they help to predict how these compounds are, those little modifications are interacting with the RNA or DNA and uh, helping us to see if we could be potentially improving solubility or specificity of the binding. And then sort of with the overall goal of not only increasing activity and decreasing toxicity, but to get the sort of best in class of these compounds into animals for long-term toxicity and safety studies, um, which you know, is sort of a stepping stone uh, in getting these into the clinic. And so with that, I would like to say thank you to both of my labs, both the Berglin Lab and Wang Lab, uh, as part of the Center for Neurogenetics at the University of Florida. Um, special thanks to the Myotonic Distribute Foundation for, uh, you know, uh, picking me to be a 2020 fellow and allowing me to do the research that I love so much. And again, special thanks to the patients and families. We couldn't do this without your involvement and, uh, you know, the involvement of the community. So thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Um, I will come up with a question uh, just um, <laughs> that um, we may have. Do you, you said that you could upregulate um, MBNL or the trapped mm -hmm. proteins. Um, uh, have you identified molecules that could upregulate up both MBNL and RB Fox? Um, I haven't actually. We just started um, sort of looking at the, the dynamics. I also do some work with foci dynamics, looking at RBFOX and MBNL and their interplay in DM2 foci formation. Oh, um, and so for right now, the diamidines, it appears as though they do sort of specifically upregulate MBNL proteins. Um, but yeah, we haven't found anything that, that upregulates FOX yet. Yeah. And do you look, how do you, um, in the fibroblasts, do you, how do you uh, look for the effect? Um, do you look at, uh, do you visualize the foci or, or what do you measure? Yeah, so um, I've done a combination of, you know, fish by itself, which is um, fluorescent in situ hybridization. So you're basically, you know, tagging those RNA that form those bundles. Uh, in the nucleus, and so you can visualize how many foci you have, and if that number goes down with drug treatment, so, and then also tagging, you know, the MBNL proteins and RBFOX and looking at how um, you can sort of release or free up those uh, proteins with drug treatment. So yeah, we've done visually, vis <laughs> we've visualized the cells in that way as well as looking at um, splicing. Great. 
great. Um, what makes you most passionate about working in DM2 specifically? Um, so excited about. <laughs> yeah, so I think um, I have, so my, my PhD work was mainly focused on DM1. And I, as I sort of said in my um, presentation, you know, the thought was, you know, and you had mentioned earlier about learning from DM1 and sort of applying that uh, to DM2. And so it was sort of like, well, why not DM2, right? These compounds have these effects that should work in DM2. And I think that sort of spurred the, the idea that, well, could we get something that works across both um, and sort of one treatment for both? Uh, and so that's really what spurred me starting my DM2 research and really sort of digging into that. Great. Um, well, thank you so much. We'll have some more general questions for you later. Um, you. But for now, we'll pass it on to Dr. Ben Hamouf to give a brief presentation about his work. Thank you. So let's just share my screen. Okay, so similarly to what uh, Jana presented, I'm also a chemical biologist and I'm developing small molecules that can target the cause of the DM2, the, but I'm targeting not the DNA level and not the protein, I'm targeting the RNA repeat expansion. I'm working in the lab of uh, Professor Matthew uh, Disney in the, at the Scripps Institute. Uh, and we are uh, world experts in targeting and then the, discovering small molecules that can help for both DM2 and DM1. Uh, so a little bit just uh, about the target and about the mutation, uh, like uh, similarly to what Joanna said earlier. So DM2 is caused by an expanded RCTUG repeat expansion that can be represented this way. You have those loops that are generated because of the CUUC uh, repeat expansion and they'll, uh, they can be expanded to even thousands of uh, repeats in cells. Another way to represent is also a 3D shape of this, this RNA that can be repre represented that, that this way. And the, we like to represent the, the RNA repeat expansion in a scheme that represents the internal loop, the, the cycle that you see here that we are looking to target because of the very uh, high leaf structure shape that they have. What we do in our lab, we are uh, trying to find new molecules that are capable to target the toxic repeat. Uh, we are looking into different uh, categories of compounds, such as antibiotics, also aromatic molecules that you can see here, natural products, uh, and also other common scaffolds. All of them we are screening and uh, uh, checking which of the compounds can have some ability to bind uh, the CCUG expansion, meaning the repeat, uh, the mutated repeat. When we find one that uh, has the ability to uh, target the CCUG expansion, we can therefore see that the compound is uh, selectively binding to the repeat. Uh, after binding and having the molecule, we are doing uh, chemistry and trying to optimize uh, this compound. Uh, uh, then we have two uh, common two strategies to uh, target the repeat. The first one is by simple binding. And uh, so what you're going to have is that the compound is going to bind and remove the sequestration of the uh, enzyme in the case of uh, DM2. It's going to be the MBNL1 or the RBFOX protein. And we found this year that by simple binding with a small molecule, we have been able to trigger the decay of the repeat by the cell itself, meaning that uh, using a small molecule, uh, a endogenous decay has been observed in a DM2 fashion there are cell line. The second approach is different. We use uh, um, compounds that are, we are. Um, a coupling to a warhead that is capable to cleave and degrade the target. 
basically here you can see that we have compounds that are linked together and we have a warhead that is going to be able to cleave the target and we call this target degradation of the RNA cleavage with the RNA cleavage module and also this year we are presenting a work and published a work on DM2 where we have been able to selectively bind and cleave the uh, toxic repeat expansion and the rescue all the associated uh, defects such as uh, alternative splicing of foci accumulation. And this is just briefly how we, uh, we worked in the lab and what are the strategies. Um, and then I would like to thank you, the organizer and the, uh, the people here uh, to uh, listen and to have interest in what we are doing. Uh, we are trying to do our best to find new ways to target those uh, diseases. Thank you, that was great. Thanks so much for the overview. Um, what is your plan for the next two years to advance your work in DM2, so, in the DM2 field? Yeah, so in the DM2, we are currently working on a new project. We have uh, actually um, uh, found a new molecule that is capable to, uh, to bind selectively a brand new molecule. And we are making a lot of different derivatives using chemistry tools. Uh, and we are looking for uh, to see if this company is also capable in their cell lines to uh, to uh, trigger the decay of the repeat itself. Um, and we have also uh, derived those compounds. Oh, sorry, we lost you. in order to enhance the activity. Okay. You were just cut out there for, for the last minute. Um, oh. But I think, I think we got a good overview. Um, did, I, did I hear you correctly? You can, you can um, correct me, but um, that you may have a way to treat the brain disease as well for DM2? That might be yes. patent to um, go through the blood-brain barrier? So exactly, we are looking for compounds that can uh, cross the blood-brain barrier, the small molecules, uh, and uh, we are actually making an effort into uh, optimizing those compounds to see if they have the properties to, uh, to cross the blood-brain barrier uh, and to see if they have an effect uh, in uh, patient their cell lines and they, uh, if they have also the ability to rescue all the defects caused by the mutation. Great, that's exciting. Um, well, thank you very much. We'll move over to Dr. Gonzalez Perez for her brief presentation. Take over the screen, Paloma. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, and be able to discuss uh, my work uh, with these wonderful researchers and with all of you. Um, eh, I'm going to uh, give a little bit of um, eh, you know, my reasons why I'm interested in DM2. I'm uh, mostly a clinician and I, um, I did my training um, during the neurology residency and also uh, the neuromuscular fellowship. And uh, these are the things that um, are for me like more intriguing regarding DM2. Uh, I think, or we know that it's probably underdiagnosed. Possibly the patients that we have in clinic are just a subset of the patients with DM2 that there is in the, there are in the population. So I think this is important because maybe we are not seeing the, the, you know, the full clinic spectrum of the disease. Uh, it's not always easy to suspect this disease in clinic. Uh, sometimes it's just muscle pain or a little bit of weakness and can be any other muscle disease. And uh, we don't know um, uh, for sure if it's going to be DM2 or maybe other type of muscle problem. So as um, Dr. Hamel mentioned, there is a delay in diagnosis, which is, I, I think, a little bit worrisome. In terms of the genetics, unlike DM1, where we can see, we, can, we know the number of repeats in the expansion. In DM2, we don't know, uh, or it's more challenging to know the number of repeats in the expansion. So from a genetic standpoint, it's also difficult uh, to know, you know how many repeats this patient has. And uh, 
uh, as far as we know, even if we know how many repeats the patient has, the, the length of their expansion doesn't associate with the severity of the disease, which is a little bit different from what we see in DM1. And also, uh, we know that there is no specific treatment. And uh, one of the things that uh, also concerns me in the clinic is when I have a patient with DM2, um, I don't know if uh, the course of this patient is gonna be mild or severe, and which organs are gonna be affected. Is the heart is gonna be affected, or the eye, or maybe some, um, uh, is this patient going to have diabetes? So we don't know, we cannot predict what is gonna happen. So um, what I'm doing uh, with my mentor, Dr. Thurman uh, Wheeler, in, uh, he has been researching uh, in myotonic dystrophy for many years, and I'm very lucky to work with him in his lab, uh, is to try to find a molecule in the urine or in the blood of patients with DM2 that help us to know how severe is going to be the disease in this patient. And also, hopefully, when the clinical trials come to test uh, different uh, drugs, maybe this molecule is going to help us to say, well, it, this drug is working or is not working. So this disease, as you know, is chronic. It's a slowly progressive. Maybe it doesn't progress. And if it progresses, it does it in a slow way. So we need something to measure if a drug is working or not. And that's why we are trying to find uh, a molecule and uh, that it's gonna be easy to get. So in urine or blood, better than a muscle biopsy, right? Um, so that can help us to know, um, you know, how severe is gonna be the disease and if the drug that we are testing or we will test in the future is working or not. So as Dr. Hamel mentioned before, um, uh, you know, here we have the RNA, right? Uh, the RNA comes from the gene, right? And here is the expansion. You can see here the expansion, all the repeats that we mentioned before. And then this expansion is like a tangle, right? And sequester very important proteins that I have uh, represented here with different colors, right? So if these proteins are sequestered in the expansion, there are other genes that doesn't, don't function well. Okay, so there are other genes that cannot function well because um, the, good the good function of these genes depend on this protein that are sequestered. So what we are trying to do is uh, uh, see um, which genes or wh which RNAs are not working well in patients with DM2. And we want to detect these RNAs not in muscle biopsies, but in urine and blood of patients with uh, DM2 and see if these changes in RNAs, um, uh, you know, the quantity of specific types of RNA give us a clue about uh, or correlates with the severity of the disease um, that, um, that the patient has over time. So because we are going to use urine and blood, so it's easy, right, to, 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 to get urine and blood over time. So it's not like a muscle biopsy that it's an invasive procedure. So we are trying to detect these uh, RNAs in, in samples that are easy uh, to get. And uh, Dr., my mentor, Dr. Wheeler, uh, already did this uh, in a DM1, and he and his group published this in 2018, as you can see here. So he detected in DM1 10 of these RNAs that are associated um, in, in, uh, with DM1, and now he is trying to see if the changes in these RNAs correlate with the severity of the disease. So we are trying to do the same now in DM2. And for DM2, as I said, you know, we um, obviously is less common than DM1, but probably, as I said, it, it's underdiagnosed. So we have to be, you know, pay attention. Every patient in the clinic with uh, a muscle problem that we don't know. Uh, what type of muscle problem it is, uh, and, and make sure you know if it is DM2. So uh, uh, we, we will be offering uh, this study um, to try to identify this molecule. And with that, I just want uh, I wanted to say thank you to you all and uh, for inviting me, also to all patients and families who participate in this project and all. Um, uh, all the members in uh, Dr. Wheeler's lab, um, and Inyan, Loren, Alex, 
and uh, everybody, all the clinicians here at MGH and other hospitals that are also collaborating with us. And of course, you know, I just got the, the grant to um, carry out this project. Uh, uh, I, I was awarded by the Muscle Study Group in collaboration with the American Academy of Neurology and the American Brain Foundation So uh, for two years. So I just started in July and it's going to be until uh, 2022. So hopefully in one, two years, I have a data to present and I hope uh, we have um, a, a few answers for you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Gonzalez. That's that's uh, exciting news, and uh, one who cares for myotonic dystrophy um, might wonder if it's even a, a screening tool eventually, mm -hmm. um, because we think we underdiagnose so heavily and miss so many people with mm -hmm. DM2. And if they are not missed and diagnosed, they are diagnosed late. So we, mm -hmm. I think, we share the experience of the diagnostic odyssey um, that patients uh, suffer from. Um, question, are you looking at uh, pre-symptomatic or pre-manifesting uh, patients as well? And what, are, what do I mean with that? People who have the genetic mutation but may not have developed symptoms or may have very mild signs on exam, but not, mm -hmm. you know, um, are, are you looking at that too to see yeah. the, uh, tracks with disease severity? Yeah, that would be great. Um, we, uh, we, we are including everybody uh, who has the mutation. So um, I, I, as, you, as you know, you know, the phenotype or sorry, the clinical features can be very different, right? Patients are, some, some of the patients are very mildly affected. And uh, actually, uh, we have, um, you know, sometimes I feel like, for example, someone who started to use statins right and then out of the blue right have these typical uh features and we diagnose uh them with a dm2 and then they are not very affected and there are other patients that are more affected so at this point we are not i think would be great if we have a presymptomatic patients uh with the mutation and not many symptoms yet because this is going to help us to um to, you know, to correlate better with the severity of the disease, you know, mild versus severe. But at this point, we are including, I mean, we are, we are starting to include everybody with the mutation. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I will ask you to just unshare your, your um, screen because they, and then we can see everyone. Um, whoever is speaking, I believe we can see. That's what Zoom should be doing because we have a couple general questions. Um, now, I'm just going to start with you before we go around, but um, what, when did you first learn about myotonic dystrophy type 2 as a clinician? Me? Um, so I knew about it uh, during the residency, but I have to say that I didn't see, I honestly, I don't remember seeing a patient with DM2 during the residency. Um, probably I saw the patient, but we didn't diagnose the patient. <laughs> Could be perfectly fine. So, but then, um, you know, later during, of course, during the fellowship and uh, now in my clinic, so I see, uh, you know, more patients. It's not obviously like I see more DM1 patients, but uh, yeah, we have uh, several patients with DM2. Yeah. All right, thank you. And then I was going to ask um, Dr. Benhamu, um, why, why did you become a scientist or researcher? What's driving your passion? Uh, first, I was always interested in uh, chemistry and biology uh, from high school. And, and then when I started my uh, uh, undergraduate uh, study, so I was, I kind of, it was obvious for me that I want to do research and I, I tend to go to chemistry and biology. And uh, that then I was uh, during my PhD focusing on uh, designing new antimicrobials to cure uh, um, infectious disease. Uh, I've become interested interested in a lot, a lot of different diseases and how we can uh, modulate and discover, discover some new molecules that can um, rescue the disease. And when I arrived to, when I arrived to, to the Disney lab, I became interested also a lot in genetic, in genetic diseases, and especially in uh, myotonic dystrophy. 
thank you. Um, and Dr. Jenkin, I'll pose that question to you um, because I know you at least, uh, uh, I, I think you have a very interesting um, biography and how you ended up being a scientist. Um, so I would like to learn more about what, um, why did you decide to become a science, scientist and researcher and bring the field forward? Um, so I actually sort of same, I was always interested in, you know, science and math. And that was just sort of, you know, what I was good at. So I was like, oh, that's what I'm going to do. And so I got my undergraduate degree in biochemistry and then immediately sort of um, went into industry actually and did that for um, about five years, I think. Um, and while in industry, I sort of, I felt myself, you know, lacking the, the drive to sort of move things forward because I was very much doing sort of production chemistry, doing the same test over and over and over again. And um, the pull to research sort, of, research sort of brought me back to wanting to do my PhD. Um, and really, it's the desire to sort of be on the forefront of it, right? And, and asking the tough questions and, and really digging into you know, disease mechanism, what's causing this? How can we, how can we use what we learn um, to, to find targets for potential therapeutics? And when we do find those targets, how can we develop and manipulate those, you know, whether they be small molecules or gene therapy approaches to, um, to access those targets and then be able to, you know, uh, help rescue whatever disease phenotype we're looking at. And um, so, and actually I started my PhD at the University of Oregon and I had met Andy and uh, Andy Berglund and I <laughs> didn't even know what myotonic dystrophy was or microsatellite expansion diseases. I didn't know RNA could mediate disease. Um, and so really talking to him and learning about myotonic dystrophy, uh, I was fascinated by it and I just really wanted to, to be in this field. So I'm really happy to continue on in the field for my, for my postdoc as well. And I think everything is excited, everyone is excited that you're staying on in the field. <laughs> um, and I've seen you at a couple meetings, <laughs> I'm, yeah, yeah. meetings and, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've met a lot of patients already too, so that's, that's great. Um, is there something that you as researchers would like to know from, from the community, from the DM2 community, questions that, that you have um, that you would like to share, or maybe um, just a message or a comment? Um, I think one of the things that um, I would, I think that for me, in terms of being on the research end of it, um, I know that I, I think I can speak for everyone when I say that I really value um, being able to interact with the DM community and, and have, you know, sessions like this and you know, when we're not in a pandemic and actually being able to, to meet and talk with everyone. Um, but I think just hearing and gaining insight to the disease that we don't have as researchers. I mean, we are sort of far removed from that sometimes when we're digging into, you know, the nuances of the disease. Um, and so I think hearing about, you know, the symptoms that are the most troublesome and, you know, just like sort of the idea that for a long time, you know, the field was focusing on myotonia and now hearing that, you know, the CNS effects are, are really uh, affecting day-to-day -day life in patients and now sort of gearing towards, you know, uh, studying that more. So I think that interaction is, is really key. And so just to sort of say, you know, we appreciate that and hopefully we can continue 
to interact with patients and hear from them and, and have, you know, foundations like the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation that really bridge that gap um, and, and more sessions like this. So. Thank you. That was a, a wonderful, I think, a concluding statement. I couldn't have said it any better, but I will share my last slide here. Um, give me one second while we navigate this uh, Zoom. Okay, now I'm switch. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, I think we're coming to an end and I am very excited that, uh, about this session and I've learned a lot um, and I'm most excited about the enthusiasm and the passion that all of us have in the field um, for DM2 and um, with that I would like to close and I thank you for participating. I thank you for asking you um, asking the questions that trigger all this research and for your participation in studies um, contributing your time and your effort. Um, and I would like to thank the three researchers who joined us today and I'm excited to, to see you and more of your work um, in the future. I would like to thank the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation for having all of us and for all your support. And I agree with Dr. Jenkins for building that connection. Um, and thank you and I, again, I hope very much that we all see one another, uh, not in Zoom, but in real life, and we can have conversations outside of the sessions at dinner, breakfast, wherever they happen. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, thank you. And have a wonderful rest of the conference.